Hi, good morning. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, well, that was, that was wonderful, Sasha. So clear and um, I think super helpful. Um, so I'm the architecture critic for the Globe and Mail. I've been the critic for about 12 years and I've written probably close to 500 articles or contributions to other books, um, journal uh, articles. And um, I can tell you it's always wonderful to have a deadline. <laughs> Writing is not easy, and if you're finding it a bit of a slog now, it never really um, gets easier. Um, sometimes there are moments when you know you can argue something powerfully and you you feel a momentum and it's flowing out of you and that's highly, highly pleasurable, probably um, akin to the runner's high. Um, so I, I would say when I'm writing and when I'm setting up what I'm going to write about, um, nobody's really ever dictating to me what my topic will be. It's extremely rare that my editors will suggest um, a subject for my column. And the way I approach my column is um, uh, maybe as you might write a score uh, or write maybe a big symphony or a pop song so that there are many different um, themes um, that I, I'm interested in. Sometimes I have to write locally. I have to write about Toronto. And those works can vary between uh, critiques of a particular work of architecture or a neighborhood or a city scale. Um, but I might also look at something that's national or affecting other cities. And in, in increasingly, I'm writing about architecture and city building around the world. Um, I want to get at some of those nuances and how I come to write with different voices at different times. Um, otherwise, certainly my job would become uh, very formulaic. And um, as I am against formula in architecture, I would hope I'm not bringing formula writing to my column or really anything I'm writing. To prepare for whatever I'm writing, I'm out in the streets, I'm looking, looking, looking in Toronto. A lot of times architects want to accompany me to said building, and that's fine, but I also then will return and go and look at a building or a neighborhood on my own. And um, I rarely write about anything unless I've experienced it um, at least once. I, so I'm talking to people, I'm looking, um, but I'm also reading a lot, not just online, but I'm reading uh, books, and this is my office. Um, I don't write from the Globe and Mail, I write from home, and within arm's length I have what I would call my um, touchstones, authors that I read many, many years ago whose work about collective memory or critical regionalism uh, or haptic uh, sensory architecture still matter a lot um, to the way um, that I, um, um, what, what inspires me about architecture and city building, what I think is important. I keep, um, I have dozens and dozens of these black um, journals uh, with notes about interviews and observations from around the world. Probably the biggest, most intense um, publication um, so far has been um, up north where Canada's architecture meets the land. Um, so. This was a two-year project. Um, it was in, inspired through conversations with Anna Porter, who is a great um, uh, leader in Canadian publishing before much of it fell apart uh, several years ago. Um, she was very interested in a piece uh, that I wrote looking at the Governor General Award winners uh, several years ago, in which my editor allowed me triple page spread uh, looking, and they sent me across Canada to look at the award winners, um, and the book flowed after um, an intense conversation in a tavern uh, downtown. Um, the book, you know, obviously wanted to sp speak to that kind of uh, mythology about 
uh, Canada and being up north, north of the 49th parallel. Um, but I also implied that kind of architecture that's slightly edgy and outside uh, large conventional uh, systems. The big mandate for, uh, and the manifesto that I wanted to push across was that increasingly we are building systems of formula. We are increasingly converting uh, hundreds of acres every day into formulaic suburban sprawl and that it's incumbent upon architecture and, art and landscape and urban designers to resist that generic approach with architecture of meaning. Um, there was, of course, the required interview with Frank Gehry, which I think really got at stuff that Frank Gehry had never really spoken about, about what it was growing up, what it was like growing up in Timmins, but also in Toronto, and the kind of pivotal key influences in his life that inspired him to become an architect and obviously um, go on to become one of the world's greats. And, um, and then I went on road trips on my own or accompanied by sort of scouts or guides in each of the provinces. This is Clifford Ween's um, uh, chapel on, uh, on um, it's Lady of the Lakes Chapel, which is now threatened with demolition. Um, I went with Bernard Flamen, um, who's a great advocate for architecture in Saskatchewan. Um, and as Sasha was saying, the relationships that you form over time, recently I just agreed to write the foreword for Bernard Flamen's book on modernism in Saskatchewan. Um, I traveled far and wide, so this is one of Pierre Thibault's uh, interventions on, uh, in a provincial park uh, well outside of Quebec City. I traveled with him. I dug these trenches with my snowshoes until they collapsed uh, in negative 40 degrees and, and then was able to talk about it with a kind of passion that obviously I wouldn't have been able to had I never really dug in. Um, I looked at some of the critical uh, uh, fundamental ideas of modernism in Canada, uh, starting back with Ron Tom and Arthur Erickson, um, the uh, Smith House on my right, and then often found great works of art to, uh, to kind of complement and work with the architecture. So this is one of uh, Gordon Smith's um, landscapes. And then the book also allowed me to write more um, compressed essays about particular architects, such as the Pat Cows, who I wanted to devote um, extra time and uh, pages to. I've also written for other books, um, but I have to say that in this kind of book, the Modern North book, so much more attention typically is paid to what's going on in Alaska or Finland, um, very little really um, devoted to architecture in Canada. And so I think, you know, um, there's huge amounts of work to be done still about getting out um, the significance of uh, contemporary Canadian architecture and not defaulting to American models or the, the Scandinavian uh, models of design, which already have such a head start on uh, legacy building. Um, different um, organizations you know, collaborated with the Goethe Institute to do this quite major monograph on Cornelia Oberlander. One of the um, most delightful uh, uh, books that I contributed to as a contributing editor was uh, for the Alphabet City uh, books, which I brought you can see the, the kind of delightful scale of them. I think they were designed by Adrian Blackwell. Um, editor was John Netchell. And um, these, were, um, these were opportunities to allow me to be a little bit um, sort of less hard hitting, to be less of an um, activist uh, critic, and a little bit more lyrical. And I thought I would just read a little tiny bit of um, part of my essay in air, it's called Catching Air, just to give you a sense of how voice must change and alter um, in order to captivate, captivate different readings, different audiences. 
What fills the air that we breathe these days? Mainly nitrogen and a much lesser amount of oxygen. Also argon, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, neon, helium, and whatever, whatever is filling up your mind. Hurricane winds, cow farts, nose diving planes, wailing mothers, hysterical children, laughter, fishes pumping triumphantly, fists pumping triumphantly in the air when Canadians beat Americans at hockey during overtime. The air is filled with the moist smell of skunk in springtime and inside the happily vacuumed North American home, dryer sheets. But besides the twinkling stars of satellites, most of what fills the air of the digital age is invisible to the eye. Electromagnetic flux, crossings of information, personal lives laid bare through Facebook, and ill-considered flaming messages that have abandoned civility for the instant pleasure of sending anger like a slap across the face, a push of the send button, and the deed is done. Into the air fly 183 billion email messages every day, more than 70% of them the result of spam and viruses. The air holds all of the inconsequence of Twitter. So there's that, but then there's the newspaper. And um, what I understand from my role as architecture critic is really varied. So occasionally I am a champion of architecture. I think I'm always a champion of great excellence uh, in architecture. I'm an advocate. Um, I'm an educator. And uh, yes, Sasha, as you were saying, you know, to use words like parti or even charrette is verboten in uh, the daily newspaper. And yet it's highly um, useful in order, you know, to be able to communicate simple, clear ideas um, and to not be caught up and give, up, give away to the doublespeak of architecture. I think it actually does a great disservice to um, the significance and potentially the rise of architecture these days. Um, so sometimes, um, as is the want of newspapers, you have to push and, and promote big trends in architecture for, for this year. Um, so, you know, I talked about just recently about reconceiving the city for a warmer world, given the flooding of, uh, and destruction of uh, New York. The climb to health, how fitness in cities is becoming more and more a part of the way architecture, um, the celebration of stairs rather than elevators and escalators. Um, I looked at highly expressive architecture coming out of West Kowloon Cultural District and the Helsinki Public Library competition. And then I looked at warmth without the warming. So I'm really pushing this year for uh, uh, fully wooden towers of architecture rather than the um, highly systemized systems of concrete uh, and steel. Um, I just wrote last Saturday about something that has deeply divided Toronto which is um, the kind of assault on Toronto and other cities in Ontario to accept uh, massive epic-scaled casino developments in downtowns. Um, and this to me, it's, this is when it becomes highly s satisfying to work for a daily newspaper. So the Globe and Mail, when I write, has a sub uh, circulation of 380,000. And um, so this kind of article has you know, over 800 uh, uh, Facebook references, uh, email references, et cetera. And I know for a fact it's circulating now in a lot of councillor offices. Um, and that's useful because my argument, uh, which is anti-casino and which lays out an argument about how casinos are um, so last century, you know, is something that they can use, and, and they're busy people, so it helps them to buttress their arguments when they have to meet in City Hall. And there is a vote in April which 40, in which 44 councillors will decide whether a major casino comes into Toronto. So I'm happy, or I'm happy to wield the pen as the mighty sword um, in many, many instances. And then I wanted to just um, talk for a minute about uh, 
um, a story I wrote recently after returning from Mumbai and after traveling extensively through India. So I knew I was going to Mumbai and um, I thought, well, I want to tell a story that nobody else has told about Mumbai. And I, I only have three days there. So, you know, I started talking to some of my contacts globally. And several years ago, I went to Dhaka, Bangladesh, and I was very, very warmly received when I was reviewing the National Assembly by Louis Kahn and um, came to know uh, many of the architects who were in the film, my architect, uh, you'll recall in the last kind of frames of that film, um, the, da the Dhaka National Assembly uh, figures very prominently. And uh, one of the guys who I became very good friends with was a young guy, uh, Tawheed, who then went on to become uh, a young junior and now a senior fellow for the TED Talks. So I emailed Tawheed, I said, I'm going to Mumbai, do you know anybody there? Young architects, I'd like to speak to them. So he put me on to Priyanka Shah, and uh, Priyanka was one of the architects I met up with in Mumbai. And she and I went to see the 27-story tower, which is a private residence built for uh, India's uh, biggest billionaire, Ambani. And we went there, we went to uh, many different sections of the city. And essentially I wrote about the obscene divide between that 27-story private tower and the people lying on the streets. But then I wanted to go further, and we went to a district of Mumbai where Priyanka had done uh, research, very quiet research, never published. Um, she's a, a, a double grad from MIT School of Architecture and um, had also been schooled in architecture in Mumbai. And um, so she took me into um, this kind of almost like a Mumbai version of an Italian hill town. And there was this wonderful great big tank of water where uh, people in the laundry cast were still uh, f uh, cleaning and flogging uh, sheets and laundry on, in this tank of water and then on the, on the steps to dry. And sections of this village within Mumbai you might consider to be a slum uh, in which most of the people uh, live in rooms about 10 feet by 10 feet. But what was interesting, rather than just kind of glossing over that piece of information, was we actually went into some of these little, little tiny cell-like homes to meet with the owners, uh, such as uh, this woman. Uh, this is one of Priyanka's uh, photographs. And what I realized very quick, quickly and what I wanted to highlight in my piece is that yes, in Mumbai you have this extraordinary wealth and this, these kind of uh, high-rise towers, but you also have people living with integrity and grace in 10 by 10 houses in which every plate is neatly stacked and organized on these kind of modern stainless steel racks. Um, and so I wrote about uh, that, and in one of the leads for that piece, this is how I wrote it. If you are as wealthy as you are shameless, like Mukesh Ambani, India's ultra-billionaire, home is a 27-story tower resembling a corporate American skyscraper. When I visited Altamount Road in one of Mumbai's upscale leafy neighborhoods, people were lying under rotten blankets at the road's edge next to a ramshackle convenience hut and a shack storing old newspapers. Next door was the Ambani house, an art architectural bully like I've never seen before, a gated fortress climbing like a beanstalk of stacked steel modules into the air. So, you know, and then I went on and said, it seems impossible that government would abrogate its responsibilities of providing basic sanitation for its citizens but such is the harsh reality of Mumbai. And what of civic leadership from some of the several dozen billionaires living in India? And then I went on and on. My last paragraph was, during my last moments in Mumbai, waiting on the tarmac for the plane to take off at sunrise, I watched as people came to life nearby in the Anawadi slum, located just beyond the international airport on the other side of a concrete wall, topped by a menacing coil of barbed wire. Catherine Boo's book, Behind the Beautiful Forever's winner of the 2012 U.S. National Book Award for nonfiction, 
provides a compelling account of life inside this slum. A boy dragged a plastic bag onto the open commons or maiden to see if there might be anything worth scavenging. Several men squatted in the open, separated by a few meters, marginally apart from each other, but fully visible from my plane. Day had broken in Mumbai, a city of tormented, wondrous, neglected humanity. So thank you very much and um, look forward to the later conversation. <laughs>